from multimedia shows to TED Talks to the G20 Summit to the Super Bowl to the United Nations to developing her next big show is all in a day's work. She's passionate about language, the language of interactivity, and between the imaginary and the real. Please welcome Natasha Sakos. Hey. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Natasha Tsakos, and I'm really excited to be here and share a few reflections with you. I'd also like to thank Joe so much for inviting me to calling all creators. I'm very excited. Okay, so I was born in Geneva, Switzerland, which is absolutely irrelevant to our story. I just needed to justify the cow because she makes me so happy every time I look at her. <laughs> but um, I developed an appetite for books at a very young age, like maybe some of you. And I'd always devour them in my closet. My closet was my secret hiding place. I had interior designed it with pillows, blankets, flashlights, Michael Jackson stickers in the inside of it. It was a magical place. And one day I picked up a new book from my, my grandfather's shelf, and I went back to the closet to read it. And this book felt different. The characters came to life, there were dialogues and even directions as to how to act it and stage it out. It was an invitation to play. So I recruited my older cousin, told her to memorize her part, as I did mine, and before you knew it, we were on the road. All sorts of venues. My mother's kitchen, my grandparents' living room, <laughs> on Daisy's apartment, her friends, friends of their friends. Boy, did we tour that family market. <laughs> and so that became tradition, and tradition turned into passion. And now, looking back, I realize I didn't fall in love with theater for what it was, but what it could be. And as an actor later on, I didn't really want to memorize somebody else's words and repeat them over and over and over again for the rest of my life. As a playwright, I, I wasn't crazy about the linear storylines. And as a director, I didn't buy into the rigidity of pretty much everything. I wasn't sold on theater's conventions. I was excited about its potential. And that's when my first existential crisis began, too, because I realized I wasn't just an actor or a playwright or a director. I was all three combined, but nobody would take that seriously. And even so, there were still no words to describe what I hadn't become yet. So, I'm an astronaut in the closet and for the past 15 years have been building my space shuttle because that's what theater is to me. It's a rocket that launches you into outer mental orbit whereby the thrust of imagination we suspend into disbelief and probe the unknown. And that's what artists do best, isn't it? They reinvent the world when it needs to be reimagined. They connect dots in unusual ways so that we might arrive at unpredictable places in our minds. They decondition our thinking by dismantling the systematic and make us feel life in surprising new ways. Making theater is defiant, courageous. It's raw and refined. It's humane and superhuman. It's transcendental and fleeting. It's magical, but is it still relevant? I'm not sure. I think creating how we're used to is just not good enough. Not when technology is accelerating, our world changing, our brains mutating, our reach expanding. Creating how we're used to is just not good enough. So how do we innovate? How do I innovate? And I know this is the billion dollar question, and I am not a programmer or a scientist, but I've become more and more fascinated with technology. I want to understand where technology is going, what is possible, and how it will affect us. 
because that will inspire the stories we tell and inform the ways in which we make them. I'm boggled by the way I learn and keep learning because that's the thing, it doesn't stop. Every day is a breakthrough. Today, socks generate electricity using microbes fed by urine. Plastic eating worms offer solution to mounting waste. Scientists invent invisible wood. It's like Albert Einstein meets Charlie Chaplin meets David Copperfield, shaked with social good. Why don't we see this kind of innovation in theater or in the arts? Don't we have new tools and materials to create new work with? Ray Kurzweil, inventor and co-founder of Singularity University, where I studied at last year, said, we won't experience a hundred years of progress in the 21st century. It will be more like 20,000 years at today's rate, which explains why everything feels like it's moving so fast. We're not crazy, it is happening because of two paradigms. Moore's Law and the Law of Accelerated Returns. Moore's Law states that price performance doubles roughly every 18 months, which is why the cell phone in our pockets is a million times cheaper and a thousand times more powerful than a supercomputer of the 70s. The Law of Accelerated Returns states that evolution, biological and technological, results in a better next-generation product. Put differently, we're using faster tools to design and build faster tools. This results in a second level of exponential growth. The rate of exponential growth itself grows exponentially. Are you overwhelmed yet? <laughs> I am, and we haven't even started. So, technology can be intimidating because we may not all speak its core language, though we use it every single day and because of the speed at which things are moving. But I have a trick. Do you know how when an ambulance drives by and the sirens are so loud you feel your temples might implode? Well, instead of covering your ears up, which really doesn't help, you can actually cancel the sound out by emitting the same sound yourself. No, but really try it, it really works. So I figured the best way to not be over overwhelmed by the speed at which things are moving is to try to move just as fast. And by the way, I know I'm supposed to be talking about my creating process, but this is it. This is my creating process right now. It's disrupting everything that I do the way that I do and think about things and gearing up for the next chapter of our century. So, Let's take a look at our new creative toolkit. In it, we have the Internet of Things, a world filled with hyperlinked objects, buildings, vehicles, and other items constantly interacting over a network. According to Cisco, there are more than 10 billion people, data, processes, things currently connected to the Internet. This is made possible in part by sensors. In the last six years, we've gone from 10 million sensors to 3.5 billion sensors. In the next four years, expect a trillion. Those sensors cost almost, well, cost less than a dollar and consume almost no energy. And with a trillion sensors and a hundred billion connected devices, Objects will develop personalities and talk to one another. Your door will anticipate your departure, miss you while you're gone, talk to the cocktail maker and greet you accordingly. <laughs> Mirrors might even develop consciousness. We're already seeing the use of sensors and projections on stage. But this opens the door to a whole new level of interactivity. The story doesn't have to end when it ends. Sounds like science fiction? 
Amazon wants to fill our living rooms with sensors and cameras to bring us augmented reality. The intended applications will probably be more consumer driven, but imagine creating a show inside someone's living room, a true home theater. Wake up and select the jungle theme. Your home transforms into a rainforest. Birds of paradise sing along with you in your intelligent karaoke Shazam shower. Meanwhile, your fridge has ordered an exotic selection of fruits delivered by Drone Truly. The lighting adjusts to set the mood. A majestic lion appears and roars your schedule for the day. <laughs> I could do that. We used to buy CDs and DVDs of the show. Now we can download it. We might end up purchasing the environmental experience instead. But what is augmented reality? It's a technology that superimposes computer-generated images onto a user's view of the real world. Those opera glasses um, project supertitles in the language of your choice, displayed in real time through the performance. The Théâtre de Paris plans on marketing the glasses to arts organizations around the world this year. It's a great start, but a world of pure imagination awaits. Imagine dematerializing special effects on stage and personalizing them for each audience member. Reality will be augmented everywhere we go. Any surface will be the surface for another surface. And everyone will move like a performance artist. And if you're not so keen about headsets, a team of scientists have created holograms you can actually touch. Speaking of touch, Haptics relate the sense of touch as a mean to communicate with computers. This company have developed an armband that will let you feel virtual reality. I've dreamt of zoos and circuses where animals are no longer needed. Well, we might finally be able to touch and pet incredible creatures that we never could before or revive extinct species. Virtually, but it will feel just as real. Which takes us to, yes, the hottest topic of the year, virtual reality. A simulation of a three-dimensional environment that you can interact with in a physical way by using a headset. Now, VR is not just for experiencing content, but making it too. Tilt Brush is an application that lets you paint the three-dimensional space around you. Back to content. Landmark is working on a virtual reality world fair where users can visit the expo and interact with digital fairgoers without ever having to leave their home. The greatest never-ending show on Earth. The Void blends virtual reality with the physical space, bringing you a new age theme park where you become the hero of your own story. We're witnessing a new phenomenon. It's no longer theater in the round, it's theater in the donuts. We're no longer sitting at a round looking at a show. We are now in the very center, looking at a 360-degree field of view with the freedom to walk anywhere and connect the dots of our own storylines. This donut phenomenon, I predict, will accelerate the emergence of immersive experiences like Sleep No More in New York City. I don't know if anyone has seen Sleep No More. Oh, go see it! Site-specific, interactive work in which the audience walks at their own pace through a variety of theatrically designed rooms. 
Immersive experiences like Sleep No More use processes similar to the making of VR and can easily be translated for it too. In turn, those creating content in VR may need to work and test in the real one. We might see interesting cross-collaborations between theater and virtual reality. Okay, we've heard all about wearables. What about hearables? This company has created earbuds that act as a sound studio in your ears. It gives you a volume knob, equalizer, special effects to transform real-world audio. What happens when you can sound design your own musical, opera, concert, life? What about software? Software that creates software. Artificial intelligence algorithms that have learned to write political speeches and even novels that are up for a literary prize. And by, machine, by using machine learning and a 3D printer, those scientists have created an original Rembrandt from scratch. And a lot of data. Speaking of data, we are capturing and producing more data every day than was ever produced by anyone since the beginning of the Earth. We haven't even talked about drones. Trick drones, film drone, selfie drone, performance drone, dance drone, music drone, lighting drone, what next? Disco drones, lighting screens, flying sets? And we haven't even touched robotics, material science, 3D printing, 3D projection mapping, the resolution revolution happening. Like I said, it doesn't stop. Technology is altering not just our perceptions, but our very many realities. It's changing us on profound neurological and biological levels. Whether we like it or not, past Botox and denial is the next generation. And they look a little like this. They're born with computing power, the world at the tip of their finger, and live most of their lives in a virtual state. How do we reach them? It's more than targeting an age range, it's addressing an evolutionary shift. Talk about an existential crisis! <laughs> what does it mean? It means we now need to think three-dimensionally which we never really had to do before. We write on a piece of paper, it's flat. We watch a movie, it's flat. We think of an idea, it's flat, it's linear. We even sometimes two-dimensionalize our own characters. But our digital immersion is becoming three-dimensional. Three-dimensional computing is even underway. It means it's now about the user, the experience, the user experience. It's no longer passive, it's active, reactive, immersive. People want to feel, they want to participate, they want it tailor-made. And the demand for resolution, comfort, speed and connectivity will keep rising. It means new stages are being created, uncharted territories in the augmented, virtual, the real reality, in people's homes, buildings, parking lots, autonomous vehicles, because what happens in a car if we no longer need to drive it? Outside, online, inside our heads and in our ears. It means art is no longer confined to a box, and artists no longer to their patrons. The doors are opened, the crowd is here, sourcing, funding, liking. Silos are collapsing, fields converging. 
It's a ripple effect of interactivity at play. It's no longer about superimposition, but intelligent integration. Yes, we do have new tools and materials to create new work with. But what good are they if we have no good story to tell? Content needs a system update and step up to the interconnected intricacies and information as today. As do we. We need new lenses, new scopes, new voices that address our emerging mythology. And now, I'm not advertising for technology at all cost. Technology for technology's sake is like knowing how to speak and having nothing to say would make a lot of funny noise. And we're making a lot of funny noise. I believe it's the delicate balance between and technology and the intelligent fusion, the natural synergy of both is inevitable as they challenge and inspire one another. As a theater maker, I've never let my work be dictated by what could or could not be done. I've always given myself permission to imagine anything and reverse engineer my way from there. We're finally living in a time where this attitude is encouraged and celebrated. Thinking 10x is the way to thrive. Jeff Holden, who leads experimental engines at Amazon, Groupon, and Uber, says, you have to be in the mindset of constantly testing crazy ideas, new models, new products, new processes. Creativity is our greatest asset. According to the Washington Post this month, the next hot job in Silicon Valley is for poets, comedians, fiction writers, and other artistic types. Great! So the tech world gets it. But what if we drove the exponential wave instead? What if artists become the operating system of technology? What impact would we cause? What innovations might arise? It might not be long till a show materializes in our living rooms, where our daily activities become part of an engaging plot, till a live production solves real-world problems, till orchestras fly in flocks of drones from city to city, deploying music everywhere till AI choreographs a ballet or rewrites a show every single night, keeping it fresh. Till robots leap across the stage so beautifully, we might one day wonder why we ever risked a human life before. What if We are entering a brave new world of possibilities that still has no vocabulary. Let's get ahead of this creative evolution. We are the frontal lobes of the universe, and the universe is expanding. We should embrace the astronaut in our closet, the explorer within, because the new stories we tell, the art we make, the rockets we build, will influence the future that shapes our present. The good news is, we are right on time. Thank you. <laughs>